every revolutionary technology is like an invasion. It gives people new hopes and aspirations, but also apprehension of what is in store for them. Not so long ago, we acknowledged the existence of computers, and today they are a household name to any schoolboy. Indeed, those boys seem to be on excellent terms with computers, seeing them not so much as machines, as rather as toys, obedient and responsive to the slightest wish. We call them computers, but they can also make drawings, play music and engage in conversation. Their main purpose is to work for us, though they can be fun too. Anyway, there are many of them, they are everywhere, and they are becoming something of a headache. Today I suggest we take up something apparently less serious, a prognostic game. The point is to consider, in a joint effort, the effect that computers, especially the smaller ones, are likely to have on this world of ours, on our way of life, on the place we live in within the prognostic period of some 30 years. This may give you an idea of science fiction about all those wonders that we are told we are in for. Now let us forget about wonders, shall we? Instead, let's try and relate computers to us, ordinary rank-and-file humans. What role are they likely to play in our everyday lives? Without being a nuisance, let's take a glimpse to see the experts' notes. Oh, threatened confusion of tongues. The Tower of Babel syndrome. Mm, very interesting. Modern pariahs. Society divided into the easily adaptive and the old-fashioned. A teacher who will still know his multiplication table from memory will enjoy the reputation of a wizard among his students. Well now, three sevens are twenty-one, are you sure? Computers are no substitute for human touch. What we want is a quick exchange of information as well as the feel of the exchange, the feel of communication. Some places of work will be discontinued, as domestic work will be much cheaper. I won't talk to a computer until it has learned to speak Czech, for instance. Look, chum, what can you offer to me for dinner tonight? You know me. I don't have to give you hints. Well, some kind of active entertainment. Information, rather than goods in short supply, will be bargained with. Okay, but if I want to send a box of plums to my granny, there's no computer to deliver it to her doorstep. What are computers going to turn us into? Modern slaves of new bureaucracy. Besides, what we are supposed to do with computer waste? Let me tell you straight away that a warming up half hour was followed by two hours of heated argument. And here are some of the pros and cons raised there. Put in a simplified way, it will have a far greater role to play in an average family than the TV has today. I say it, avoiding the word computer, because it will not exactly fit. Computation will add up to 1% of the total of their services at most. A universal family helper seems a better description. Maybe a good servant and a bad master. Out of the many things the computer could act as a substitute for, 
let me mention at least the following. A meticulously kept diary, going to libraries, the teaching part of school education, bargain hunting, naturally also the TV and cinema, as we can expect computers to be gradually integrated with television, video, and similar technical wonders. And now try and project what I've been talking about into housing and residential development. Computer games have become all the rage now. These are mostly one-man affairs marked by a certain degree of aggressiveness on the part of our opponent, the computer. But we can visualize games designed for a fairly large, loose community of people joining in them via a multi-point network. This would offer scope for lots of interesting things, provided someone has a real go at this new genre. Unfortunately, there doesn't seem to be anyone as yet to build it up. Or let's take up education. All right, there's no substitute for schools, but theirs will be an increasingly educational and social role at the expense of today's instructional mission, because there'll be computers to take care of that. Not that the computer can take over the teaching job. I'll still need the teacher, but she can send me my homework down the terminal, she can talk to me on the TV screen, I shall not have to be present at school in person because she will be in touch with me. I can even sit for a long-distance examination. However, the important thing about schools is that there will no longer be the conventional classrooms, but rather a kind of special interest club rooms and laboratories. Architects had better start contemplating a rational rearrangement of school buildings, their interior layout. By the way, people's free time is going to be a formidable problem, as there will be extra reasons for people to squat in their homes, so it's essential that they should go in for extra exercise. Note the things that people today place notices in newspapers for. Most of it boils down to exchange, sale or purchase of all sorts of items. As for human contact, the most you can expect is someone looking for a teacher of languages, the piano, or for someone to do odd jobs. And yet, the computer networks of the future should make it possible for you to advertise the more substantial aspects of your personality. A look at life in present-day housing estates. There are justifiable complaints about people living in isolation from their next-door neighbors. And that is where computers should help us to find people of shared interests and hobbies and to establish the desired contact there. Say, a sports lover feels like playing a volleyball match the next day. So he feeds a message into the computer network to invite whoever is interested to ring him up at 8 p.m. tonight to fix the exact hour. In this way, you can arrange a meeting of people who would never have met otherwise. Or musicians can get partners to play with in an ad hoc ensemble, 
or maybe even other people willing to or even anxious to listen to them. What I've said suggests, I think, the magnitude of changes in housing development, at least as regards the interior layout of buildings. Some buildings will have lost the reason for being there at all and consequently given way to others. But there is one point I want to raise. What about the people who failed to catch up with the computer era? who will not want to or know how to use the computer. I think they'll be far worse off than those who today boycott the TV or the car, because today there's still the cinema, there's public transport, there are buses and railways. But when the computer era sets in, some services and some operations will have become totally computer dependent. Now, where will those people turn to? I mean, in emergency cases because there'll still be many situations permitting them to go without computers even then. I'm referring to the kind of natural human beings who are happy to live in seclusion somewhere in the highlands, tending sheep and other domestic animals and growing potatoes to have their own food supply in a sort of closed cycle. Such people do exist and will probably always exist. Maybe we ought to take it the other way around. Man need not always get adapted to technology. Who knows, this technology, which goes under the general name of computers, may well have to be adapted to man, to respect his qualities and help arrange things in a better way suited to exactly those human qualities. So one conceivable line of development is that in the future each home will have a special room reserved for computer work. What is more, this technology may well rid us of some rather unnatural operations such as we have to perform today, so that we can return, at least in part, to some of the simpler and more natural jobs. Maybe we shall spend more time outdoors, maybe we shall engage more in manual work and less in tedious mental effort spending more time thinking, reflecting things, enjoying the beauties of nature. In a way, there should be more contemplation and not just practical utilization all the time. Briefly, our style of life may benefit from the retrospective change in the positive sense of the word. All the good things we had to abandon will be enjoyed again. Nějaké praktické zúžitkování. Zkrátka možná, že to změní náš životní styl určitým směrem jakoby naspět, ale jen v tom, v tom pozitivním smyslu. Všechno dobré, co jsme museli opustit, možná bude znovu za to úvahu. Not even the new technology can change anything in the fact that urban living will remain the predominant style in the next century too. And we ought to prepare the right conditions for that, 
trying to make living in towns a pleasant and salubrious affair with lots of natural surroundings and a restful atmosphere where people would feel fine, reluctant to leave their towns and happy to return there. Won't people feel lonely in the middle of all that modern technology which develops infinitely faster than they themselves? I didn't have any true feeling of isolation. I can even give an example to the contrary. In my own experience, computers can even add to the range of social contacts. I often felt I was not alone in my room unless I had switched off all the systems as anyone was able to reach me with some information. Já nejsem doma sám, pokud jsem všechny tyto zařízení nevypnu, protože kdokoliv mohl vlastně do té místnosti s těmi informacemi nastoupit. Those are the words of a man just returned from Japan. Excuse me, what was it really like working there? Moje osobní zkušenosti... My personal experience, albeit involving just the writing of articles and reference retrieval, is that if you have an efficient personal computer, naturally linked to the relevant computer networks and to good quality software, your time savings will be great enough to increase your labor productivity sixfold. Japan is said to have three quarters of a computer per one student. Does that pay? The students have thus been given great scope of personal, individual and, and I can say truly creative work. Unlike our universities, it was no exception to see some laboratory-type studies literally crowded with students as late as 2 a.m. The reason, as I see it, is that here they saw a chance to cut down on routine work and to enjoy the new scope for more interesting activities, as naturally only creative work is the more interesting option. Rutinní, jak si činnost omezovat a otevřel jim prostor pro zajímavější a samozřejmě zajímavější je jenom tvůrčí činnost. Obchody budou dvojího typu, jedny budou. There will be two types of shops. Exclusive shops located probably downtown, where buyers will be able to enjoy the thrill of personal contact with the assistants and salesmen, and shopping facilities all over the suburban housing estates, quite different from today's supermarkets. A kind of highly efficient, computer-controlled stores, ready to take and carry out computer-mediated orders from people's homes, for the ordinary everyday type of shopping where no personal selection is really needed. Naturally, there'll have to be an equally efficient delivery service. I rather think, and there's a body of experience to support this view, as extra evidence of the wide range of computer application, that even exclusive items of goods can be chosen by means of this technology, provided it is sophisticated enough. 
If, say, you are about to buy new clothes, and such special technical means are already in existence, in advanced shopping facilities, the communication channels must transmit the color of the material, the harmony of style and cut, and all those things in a good enough quality for the potential buyer to make his or her choice. Where clothing, music, or anything even remotely related to art is concerned, I shall never let computers, however sophisticated in that sphere, World psychiatric literature includes a number of reports on computer addiction, and my medical friends have already had a case of this kind in this country too. This is the case of a young man who has become so fascinated by his newly acquired computer that he spends increasingly more time playing with it, developing programs of computation, and driving himself into seclusion, since the computer has been allowed to grow into a partner for communication. Unlike human partners, the computer offers a number of advantages, as it is always reliable, ready to be switched on and off again at any time the young man so wishes. It is incapable of playing any unexpected malicious tricks on him. And so for people who are somehow unable to come to terms with the surrounding world in a conflict-free way, it becomes a surrogate partner, a substitute for the outside world. And yet I think that computers, of all things, might sometime in the future help people find new ways of approach to their fellow beings, ways which are very hard to find today. What strikes me as particularly interesting and attractive is that this might offer a return to life and to society, to people in some way or other handicapped or afflicted, who could find their way back to the community via computer facilities. After all, computers offer scope for communication even to people with amputated limbs who can do hardly more than move their eyelids. With electronic sensors picking up the eye movements, the affected person can communicate with the rest of the world. After all that has been said, let me try and sum up what my personal hopes reside in. Perhaps every new invention in history developed along a curve, which we sometimes call the growth curve. Our interest in computers is somewhere here. We are forging ahead, fighting our way up, and sometimes we are also afraid of going up. Compared to the history of the railway, we are currently at the point where we are thinking of having a man with a little flag run ahead of the locomotive and at the same time fearing lest we should miss the train. I'd give anything to live to see the day when we have reached this or this or that point and when we feel at ease talking about computers the same way we are discussing the trains today seeing in them a kind of friendly technology with the trains behaving themselves unobtrusively fitting in the landscape with pleasant herbs and plants decorating the banks of railway lines which i think has more human dimensions than motorways or aircraft i wish we could live and see this kind of thing with computers
we may not be entirely aware of the fact that the rhythm of our time was really set at the time of the Industrial Revolution. The state of the technology of the day made it necessary for people to gather at one place, to start work and to finish the shift at the same time. But then technology has undergone considerable change since then. There are many places where work could be organized quite differently. Already today, there are activities which could be performed practically anywhere, in people's homes, for example. Thanks to progress in computers and in modern communication techniques, the range of such activities is sure to expand and new ones may well be added to the list. This applies practically to all the non-manufacturer sphere. According to some estimates, up to 40% of this sphere may, at some time in the future, be able to work in their homes, at least part of the time. They too, of course, would have to meet at their central place of work on some days. After all, there is no substitute for personal contact. Office blocks are unlikely to disappear, at least as regards their representative function, though many will lose much of their importance. The reduced need for space offers scope for accumulation and for the accommodation of new roles. In contrast, flats, today empty for most of the working hours, will be made better use of. The elimination, or rather the abatement of the morning and afternoon rush hours, would bring relief to municipal transport. Let's be realistic though, there'll still be a great deal of commuting and traveling, with a passenger car likely to remain the principal means of transport. Its engine will be microcomputer controlled and we shall communicate with it. No traffic is likely to remain in the downtown center. This will serve as a pedestrian zone ready to accommodate again some of the functions which became extinct long ago.
encounters, inspiration, entertainment, rest, the simple joy of strolling about, the pleasure of discovering unknown cozy nooks, adventure. Prognostication is a deceptive affair. Most forecasts never come true, and if they do, there's always something of the naive atmosphere of Jules Verne's stories in them. One thing seems to be certain right now, though. Computers are going to change our conventional way of life, and urban life in particular. How soon the change will come, and what benefit it will be to us, depends on all of us, on you, and on you too. Indeed, on all of you and all of us. On whether we shall be able to understand this new technology properly and shed the ties of convention. So let's have a go at it.